Welcome to Relation Tales. Please like this video and subscribe Relation Tales. Dad, it's Mom. Pete smiled when he picked up the phone from his daughter. He knew this call would be from his wife, Joan, and he was happy to talk to her for the first time that morning. Joan said, Hey baby, can you supervise a group of teenagers today? Eva and her friends have been planning this for weeks. I just need to follow their instructions. They're not little kids. They're 19 or 20 years old. She asked, did you set up the pool the way she wanted? He replied, yes, I set up the pool, lounge chairs, bar, and grill. I did all that while you were away. Maybe next year you can chaperone, huh? Don't tell me you're not looking forward to spending the afternoon with a group of teenagers in bikinis. By the time I get home, you'll be ready for me. Remember, one of them is our daughter and two are like surrogate daughters. I don't need a dozen bikini-clad teenagers to be ready for you. I'm ready for you all the time. I know, and I like that. Did you have a good trip? She asked. We did. It was a good learning conference, she replied. Joan worked for a mid-sized investment firm in a Nashville suburb as a senior investment advisor for nearly six years. That's great. Sweetie, have a safe trip back from San Jose. Thanks. I'll see you later this afternoon. Love you, Joan. Love you, Pete. Eva rolled her eyes at her dad, but was glad her parents still loved each other. Pete thought about how he had been Joan's romantic partner before they had kids, then the father figure when their oldest went to college. Now, he was like a teddy bear to her. He didn't mind. Eva enjoyed snuggling next to him and treating him like her teddy bear, Pete. Eva and her two best friends had been busy preparing for the party. Eva was starting her third year studying medicine at Vanderbilt University, which was about 20 miles from her parents' home in Franklin, Tennessee. She lived with her friends in an apartment on campus. Lily and Carrie, her best friends, stayed over and helped in the morning. Lily, a tall African-American with light brown skin and long curly hair, playfully teased Pete for being shorter. Pete enjoyed having her around because she felt like another daughter to him. Lily ran track at Vanderbilt on a scholarship and was studying math and computer science. Carrie, Eva's friend since elementary school, got into Vanderbilt because of her parents' wealth and connections, despite her set scores. A petite blonde at 5'2", she was voted most likely to buy an island in high school. Under the backyard pavilion and outdoor kitchen that Pete mostly built, the table was set for lunch. Friends would arrive any minute. It was a gorgeous August day. Eva, inheriting her mother's organizing skills, had kept her father busy. Pete, more bashful than boastful, had built and run his small consulting firm. If there were a vote among the girls' fathers on the best dad, Pete would likely win. After serving food and drinks, Pete said, Okay, ladies, I'm going back inside. Let me know if you need anything. Lily asked, Are you sure you don't want to stay and eat with us? Thanks, Lily. This is for all of you. I'm good. This afternoon was for the girls. Pete kept busy in his office, which overlooked the pavilion and pool. When the girls started removing their cover-ups, he moved to the den to watch the Braves game, avoiding any appearance of being a creeper. After about 20 minutes, he heard a commotion by the pool. Investigating, he saw a large young man grabbing Carrie's wrist and trying to pull her away. Her friends surrounded them, yelling for him to stop. Pete ran outside, yelling, Hey, let her go! The guy, about 6'3", smirked and kept dragging Carrie, who was much smaller. As Pete got closer, the guy pushed Lily, causing her to stumble into Pete. Recovering, Pete ran to block the gate. Let me go. Ricky, Carrie yelled. Girls, get back. The other girl stepped back, but didn't go far, some filming the incident. I said, let her go, Pete shouted. Ricky, unfazed, tried to jab at Pete, who dodged and punched Ricky in the solar plexus, causing him to release Carrie. Pete then kneed Ricky in the groin, bringing him to his knees. Get out of my backyard. Ricky slowly stood, threatening Pete. You aren't as big as my old man said. I'm going to enjoy this. Ricky swung again, but Pete dodged and tripped him, sending him to the ground. Just leave. I don't want to hurt you, Pete said as the girls giggled at the scene. Ricky mocked Pete, calling him a little teddy bear. Ricky attacked again, but Pete, now angry, dodged and delivered a series of punches to Ricky's side. Ricky fell, taking time to get up. When he did, Pete twisted Ricky's arm behind his back and marched him out the gate. Ricky, now in pain, taunted Pete about his wife. Pete dismissed the taunts as lies and threatened Ricky if he continued. Ricky banged on Carrie's car, denting it, before slumping into his BMW and leaving. The girls were filming and making gestures at Ricky. 
Pete told them, the show is over, back inside. And please don't share that video yet. Let's talk about it first. Pete heard Eva say, Daddy, your nose is bleeding. Lily took charge right away, telling everyone to make space for Pete on a lounge chair under an umbrella. Eva, find him a clean shirt. Carrie, get a bag of ice, she ordered. She helped Pete sit down and used his shirt to stop his nosebleed. The other girls, surprised by Pete's strength, eagerly offered to help, but Lily kept things organized. One girl brought him a drink while another tried to help him lie down. The rest talked excitedly about what had happened, staring at Pete. When Carrie and Eva came back, Pete put the ice on his nose and asked, Who was that guy? Who raised someone like him? Carrie, what did he want from you? Eva answered, That idiot is Ricky Farmington, the son of Mom's boss, Andrew Farmington. Pete's concern deepened. Oh crap, he realized. The accusations might hold some truth. Carrie explained, He asked me out again after one date, and I declined. I'm sorry he came here. He probably saw the party on social media. She pleaded with her friends, Please stop posting about our plans. Then she asked Pete, How did your nose start bleeding? He never touched you. Pete replied, It happened when I tried to catch Lily. She bumped into me and shot my nose. He smiled at Lily. I'm so sorry. Dad, when he pushed me, I didn't mean to bump your nose. Pete reassured her, Don't worry, it's not broken, just sore. Lily felt relieved, concerned about the videos. Pete said, Please don't share videos of what happened. No social media, emails, or texts. Please. Why? Daddy, you didn't do anything wrong, Eva asked. Pete explained, I don't want rumors about your mother spreading. Also, Ricky might retaliate if the video gets out. He could be dangerous and try to hurt one of you. Eva asked, Are you going to call the police? Pete nodded. We don't have to press charges now, but he assaulted Carrie and Lily, tried to assault me, and damaged Carrie's SUV. I'll get someone to take our statements. You can still enjoy the party by the pool. He asked, Carrie, is your wrist all right? Yeah, just a bruise. Nothing serious, Pete nodded. Carrie then asked, Mr. C, where did you learn to fight like that? Rick's a big guy and has won several fights. It's kind of boring. Are you sure you want to hear this? A dozen bikini-clad girls nodded eagerly. Pete shrugged. In high school, kids made fun of how short I was. Both my parents were short too, so I knew I wouldn't grow much taller. I ran track and cross country and did well, even competing in state finals. One night when I was a junior, I was out on a date and a couple of guys started bothering us. I tried to ignore them, but they kept bothering me. My friends stepped in and scared them off. I told my dad about it, and he found a martial arts studio for me in Knoxville. He told me, be the best you can be, but only use it for self-defense. I trained there twice a week until I went to college at Georgia Tech. At college, I kept learning different martial arts like Silat, Judo, and Jiu Jitsu, all focusing on protecting myself. The instructor, who was older in my height, and his daughter, who was the same size as Eva, were really good fighters. I trained with them for four years, when I married Joan. We lived in Atlanta, and I reduced my training to once a week. Eva, when you started college, I found a local studio and began studying again. I'm not as good as before, but I managed, Eva said. Daddy, I never knew. You didn't need to remember when we took you and Donnie to Paris when you were in seventh grade. We went to that Moroccan restaurant in a shady part of the city. I didn't want to go because it seemed unsafe, but your mom insisted. On the way back to the car, two guys, one tall and one short, came up behind us. I gave your mom the keys and told her to take you to the car, start it, and honk once inside, Eva nodded. They yelled at us to stop. You told mom to take us to the car. Yes, the tall one pulled a knife and demanded money. I acted like I didn't want trouble, but took his knife and stabbed his knee. He screamed. The short guy pulled his knife, but I disarmed him too. Their friends started running towards us, so I ran to the car. Your mom had pulled onto the street, ready to go. I jumped in, and we sped off. That was the only other time I faced something like this before today. Pete didn't tell them the whole truth. One time after Donnie and Eva were born, just before moving to Nashville, he and Joan were out dancing in Atlanta. Joan's ex, Bobby Taylor, an Atlanta Falcons player, approached them. Joan didn't think much of it, but when she accepted his dance invitation, Pete was fuming. Later, Pete followed Bobby to the restroom, where Bobby made comments about missing Joan. Pete wasn't having it. 
When Bobby tried to push past him, Pete put him on the floor, breaking his ulna. Bobby's career suffered as a result, and he was eventually traded. No charges were filed. Pete addressed Eva's friends. Please don't share that video. There should be exactly 13 copies, including mine, and no more. The girls promised, and Pete hoped they meant it. Forget about that idiot, Lily quipped. You mean he's in a hole. Pete smiled while the girls laughed. He went inside to call the police. When the officer arrived, the girls hurried to cover up and told him what had happened. The officer checked Carrie's wrist, which was red but not badly hurt. Pete's nose had stopped bleeding, and Carrie's mom had arrived. They talked for about 30-40 minutes. After the police left, the party started again. Carrie hugged her mom goodbye and watched her leave. Eva asked Pete, Dad, can we stay here until we go to cars? We plan to go out dancing after dinner, but prefer to dance here tonight. Of course, Eva. I love having you here. She hugged him and returned to her friends. Pete caught the last inning of the Braves game, and they were losing. He got a text. Plane delayed. We'll be home late. He sighed, feeling uneasy about Ricky's words. Pete danced with more of Eva's friends, who tried to teach him the electric slide, much to their amusement. Around 10 p.m., they left for Carrie's. Pete got hugs and thank yous from the girls. Cleaning up outside, he heard the garage door open. Joan was home. He helped with her bag, and she hugged and kissed him. I missed you. How was the party? It was interesting. I'll tell you in a minute. They just left for Carrie's. I thought they were going out dancing. They decided to dance here. Did you watch them from inside? She teased. No, Lily pulled me outside, and I danced with most of them. Well, if I weren't so tired, I'd take care of you. Pete wasn't in the mood either. Let me get your bag inside, and I'll pour you some wine. I have quite a story to tell. Curious, Joan followed him in. She sipped her wine as he sat across from her. This must be serious, she said, snickering. Pete recounted the incident, leaving out Ricky's comments. Joan was shocked someone would attack Sweet Carrie. When Pete revealed the assailant's name, Ricky Farmington, Andrew's son, Joan was in disbelief. No way. There must be some mistake, she added. Clearly, Andrew forgot to teach him a few things, Joan giggled. Wait, you took Ricky out? My husband, all 165 pounds, punched that tank? What's the joke, she laughed, finding it hard to believe. Pete was not amused. Joan saw his disappointed expression and said, Oh, come on, Pete. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, but be realistic. How else could he take it? I'll be there as soon as I finish this glass. She was shocked when he said, Don't bother. Joan went to the kitchen, calling to him, but he didn't reply. Upstairs, he wasn't in their bedroom. He was in a guest room. She asked, Pete, what are you doing in here? I missed you and wanted to snuggle with my teddy bear tonight. Teddy bear, he wondered if the nickname was affectionate or mocking. He was too tired to argue and said, Guess we'll both be disappointed. He closed and locked the door. After a few minutes of knocking and pleading, she left, confused and thinking her husband must be losing his mind. The next morning, Pete knew she'd sleep late after her long flight. He wondered if she even went on the trip, which irritated him. He sneaked into their bedroom for his running clothes, had a small breakfast, and went for a long run. Seven miles later, he returned. Joan looked unhappy. Mister, we need to talk. I don't think you told me everything last night. He ignored her and went to the shower, locking the door behind him. After showering and dressing, he went to his office, where Joan was waiting. Andrew called. Ricky had blood in his pee and went to the earth. Ricky told Andrew you shot him from behind, and they want to file charges. Pete answered. He's lying, obviously. He's upset that your teddy bear kicked him out. Andrew's really mad. Why did you attack him? Because he was attacking Kai, you know, the Kai we've loved like a daughter for more than 10 years. He was pulling her out of our backyard, and I stopped him. Do you trust their story more than mine? Do you think I hit him out of nowhere? Joan said, I'm sorry, Pete. I just can't believe you could do that face to face. Pete was frustrated. So you think I couldn't handle him face to face? No offense, honey, but he's huge. Remember Paris? You were running from that little guy. That was after I dealt with the big guy. This is pointless. He realized she doubted him. She continued, Do you know how difficult this will make things for me? Pete was surprised. Oh, excuse me. What was I supposed to do? Use a weapon? My hands. He replied, 
Nonsense. I've seen you work out. How could you hurt Ricky with just your hands? Thanks for the faith, he said sarcastically. She rolled her eyes. What do I tell Andrew? Tell him his son needs to apologize to Carrie and me. I will not. Ricky said he did nothing wrong. Pete shook his head. You must be delusional to believe him over your husband. Did Andrew give you pills while you were traveling? Joan's face flamed, about to reply when a vehicle drove up and honked. Relieved, they saw Eva, Lily, Carrie, and her dad Brian arrive in a Bentley. The girls hugged Pete and Joan. Then Brian shook Pete's hand. Pete, thank you for looking after Carrie. It means a lot to me. Pete, uncomfortable with the parade, said, We love Carrie. No way was I letting that idiot leave with her. You'd have done the same. Joan asked, Girls, can you explain what happened? I'm hearing different stories from Ricky and Pete. Eva asked, You don't believe Dad? Not exactly. I just want to hear it from someone else. It all sounds so preposterous. Pete shook his head and went inside. He grabbed his laptop and an overnight bag, needing some time to think. When he came back, Brian, Carrie, and Lily were gone, and Joan looked shocked. Pete asked, So what are we going to do about that idiot? Someone needs to teach him manners. Joan scoffed. And you think you can do it? Pete couldn't believe it. He's probably pretty pissed, Joan said. I don't think you'll be so lucky next time. Pete's face turned from shock to fury. When did you lose all respect for me, Joan? What? You're being ridiculous. My feelings haven't changed. I'm proud of you. Well, call me skeptical. Did you know I have C-level contacts from Fortune 500 companies who respect me? Apparently, I get more respect in my industry than at home. These last couple of days have been very educational. What does that mean? Not for you to worry about. I've decided if Ricky or his father doesn't apologize to me and Carrie by 6 p.m. tomorrow, Brian and I will call the police. He needs to pay for the hood of her SUV too. You can't be serious. I still have to work with Andrew. Maybe you can convince him to teach his son some manners. This could hurt your job. But look at what this is doing to us. Tomorrow, 6 p.m. Or we're calling the police. I'm going out for a while. No, you aren't. We aren't finished talking. We are finished, and I need to get away from you. I'm going to Brian's to discuss this. Since Andrew listens to you, tell him what his kid must do to avoid jail. The clock's ticking. Pete, come back here. He ignored Joan, walked into the garage, put his bag in the car, and drove away, leaving her standing there frustrated. Pete had never done anything like this before. On the way to Brian's, he decided he needed to travel for work to distance himself from Joan and find out if she was involved with Andrew. He believed she might have given in to Andrew. Joan, Brian, and Pete agreed to meet at 6 p.m. tomorrow, or they would call the police. Pete went to a hotel and worked with the Braves game on in the background. Around 5 p.m., his phone rang. He had blocked Joan's number for peace. It was Eva. Hey, baby. Hey, Daddy, Eva said. I'm driving back to the apartment. Are you nearby at Vanderbilt? Eva shared an on-campus apartment with Carrie and Lily. It was an unusual arrangement, likely made possible by a significant donation from Brian, who was wealthy and well-connected in Nashville. Pete replied, I am. I'm at the residence, room 413. I'll be there in a few minutes. Ten minutes later, Eva knocked on the door and hugged Pete tightly. I don't understand. Daddy, why doesn't Mom believe us? She asked. She doesn't think I can protect my family, Pete said. Eva responded. She should. I told her about Paris. Pete shrugged. Let me guess. She didn't believe you. Eva nodded, tears in her eyes. I'm sorry, baby. Maybe Andrew convinced her I don't measure up. You don't believe what Ricky said, do you? Pete wanted to suggest that Joan was involved with Andrew, but didn't. No, he was just talking smack. He hated lying to Eva, but didn't want to tarnish her view of her mother. Don't worry, sweetie. Everything will be fine. I want to believe you, Daddy, but I'm worried, she replied. Don't be. We'll be okay. She wondered if he meant just the two of them or their entire family. She left shortly after. School was starting soon, and she had a few days left in her summer internship. The next day, Pete used his home security app to check when Joan left for work. Running his own consulting company gave him flexibility, but it was hard to get away during a marital fight. By lunchtime, he saw 20 texts from Joan, mostly accusing him of being unreasonable. The last one said, You win. 
He'll be there at six. I left you a voicemail. Pete listened to her voicemail. Andrew said Ricky would apologize at six o'clock tonight. I'm still not happy with you for putting me in this situation. We can talk after everyone leaves. Pete rolled his eyes. Somehow, it was still his fault. He planned to drive to Louisville that night for a client session, arriving early to do some pre-work. At 5.45 p.m., Brian and Carrie arrived. Carrie hugged Pete, and Brian shook his hand. This should be interesting. Are you and Joan okay? It sounds like this is tough on you, Brian said. We will be, Pete replied, struggling with the idea of her little husband punching Ricky. I'm surprised too, but you always seem well prepared. Thanks, Brian. Hopefully, Joan will remember that. If you don't mind, let's wait out here. I don't want Ricky in my house. I wouldn't either. A couple of minutes before 6 p.m., Ricky arrived in a red BMW, not looking happy. Joan wasn't there yet. Ricky approached them and said, Carrie, I'm sorry about Saturday. I was out of line. I missed you and took your rejection poorly. I hope I haven't destroyed our friendship. Carrie replied, I don't know if we'll ever be friends again, Ricky, but I'll try to be polite and friendly. That's the best I can do right now. Ricky turned to Brian. Mr. Williamson, I'm sorry about what I did to Carrie and her SUV. Send us the bill and we'll take care of it. He didn't seem very sincere. Finally, he looked at Pete and the contritness disappeared. Mr. Clark, I apologize for interrupting the party and barging onto your property. Okay, Ricky, thank you. I think we're done here. As Ricky walked back to his car, he smirked and mouthed Kitty to Pete, who responded by opening his hand, indicating he needed proof. Ricky grinned and drove off. His apology to Carrie seemed sincere, but not to us. What did he say to you? Brian asked. Nothing important. Just trying to provoke me again, Pete replied. Carrie felt guilty for ever dating Ricky. Brian said, If you need help, let me know. I can get lawyers on him and his father or even arrange a deputy to shadow him for a weekend. Thanks, Brian. Let's hold off for now. I have other problems to resolve. After dropping Eva home, Carrie told her parents about Ricky's comments about Joan. They didn't believe Ricky, or at least they hoped it wasn't true. Brian and Pete shook hands. Carrie hugged Pete, and then they left. As Pete was pulling out of his driveway, Joan's car approached. He didn't wave and drove towards Louisville, needing time to figure out his next steps. Ten minutes later, his phone rang. He decided to answer. Hello, Joan. Pete, are you just going to the store and coming back? No, my client needs me in Louisville early. I'll be there until Friday afternoon. Why would you say that? I only travel every six to eight weeks. It's nothing. Had you been there Saturday... You'd have seen everything. I'm still upset you took Ricky's side. I know, and I'm sorry. Did Ricky apologize? He apologized to Carrie sincerely, but was disingenuous to Brian and me. Be glad he's not going to jail. He's just a kid, Pete. Heck, a 20-year-old who needs to control his anger and respect others, Joan sighed. Can we talk when you get home Friday? Sure. I'll miss you, Joan. He hung up. Joan was surprised by how he ended the call. She thought this would blow over soon. On Friday, she'd prepare a nice dinner and plan a special night. The three-hour drive to Louisville gave plenty of time to think. He suspected Ricky knew too much for it to be idle gossip. If Andrew slept with married women, it wasn't surprising he shared inappropriate details with his son. Pete suspected Joan and Andrew were having an affair, possibly even in town as Ricky suggested. Pete planned to travel a lot, hoping to catch them by surprise. He thought about hiring a private investigator, but chose to install hidden Wi-Fi cameras at home instead. He ordered the cameras to be delivered to his hotel on Thursday, hoping they wouldn't record anything but not feeling confident about it. It was a long week for everyone. Eva called her dad a few times, and he assured her he was fine. Donnie called once to check on him too. Joan left texts and voice messages saying she loved and missed him, conveniently when Pete was with clients. He was glad because he didn't want to talk to her. On Friday, he drove home, dreading what might await him, but it went better than expected. Joan greeted him in a flattering dress and heels, indicating she wanted to go out. Pete was fine with that since it would keep things light until they got home. They went to a favorite steakhouse, and Joan was affectionate all night despite his irritation. Pete couldn't help but be affected by her charm. Once home, Joan immediately initiated closeness. They didn't make it past the family room before she undressed and seduced him, 
Afterward, they continued in the bedroom. Joan expressed her love, and Pete replied, I love you too. Joan, though she missed the past tense, she fell asleep believing everything was fine. The next morning, Joan was already awake, drawing circles on Pete's chest. She thanked him for the previous night, and he admitted it was nice. Then she mentioned needing to go to Memphis for a client meeting on Thursday. Pete questioned the sudden trip, but she explained it was urgent. She asked if he was okay, and he mentioned his own upcoming trip to Orlando and Savannah for work. This revelation led to another round of closeness, which they both enjoyed. Over breakfast, Joan asked if they were okay and expressed her love. Hoping to move past the recent tension, Pete smiled and squeezed her hand, saying he wanted that too. Joan tried all weekend and into the next week to show her love, not just through lovemaking, but Pete felt the end was near. He installed a GPS tracker on her car and placed hidden Wi-Fi cameras and microphones throughout the house, feeling terrible about it, but needing to know the truth. On Thursday morning, Joan kissed Pete goodbye. He asked, Will you drive your car to Memphis or get a rental? I'll take mine. The company will reimburse the mileage, and I'll be safer driving my car. Okay, be careful. I will, baby. Love you. Love you too. A few hours later, when she should have been at their Brentwood office or on I-40, the GPS showed her car at Andrew's house. Pete's fears were confirmed. His marriage was over. Needing to burn off steam, he went to his dojo to spar and work out, determined to stay sharp in case he ever confronted Andrew. Thanks again, Joan, he muttered. Joan texted him later, saying she had made it to Memphis safely, but the GPS still showed her car at Andrew's house. Pete prepared for his fake trip to Orlando, deciding to hire a pie to tail his wife early Friday morning. He got an email titled, For the Kitty Bear, with a link to a cloud account showing live and recorded videos from Andrew's home. He saw Joan and Andrew undressing and being intimate in the family room. Pete drove to the airport, parked in long-term parking, and called Joan, leaving a message that he was flying out. Then he went to the airport Marriott to watch the evidence. Stupid kid, he muttered. Pete didn't need to see more. Watching Joan's car at Andrew's house overnight was enough. He listened to the videos, enduring the sounds of their affair to gather information. Andrew's voice, I know you're pissed, but you don't have to reclaim me. Joan, I know. I'm still mad about Ricky's apology. Andrew thundered. You need to control your little husband. I've been withholding from him like you asked. She lied. I don't ask. You do what I say if you want the benefit. Joan was tired of Andrew's control. I love Pete. He's a good father and husband. I'm not giving him up. Andrew scoffed. If you love him, why are you screwing me? You know why? Sometimes I miss being with a big man, Andrew. It's okay, baby. It's not just your size. I like being with someone taller when I'm in heels. I like feeling big muscles. I miss that sometimes, Andrew soothed. Keep taking care of me, and I'll take care of you. But if you can't control him, I may have to talk to him. I'm still mad at him for sucker punching Ricky. She snapped. You will not hurt my husband, do you hear me? This surprised both Andrew and Pete. Andrew sighed. Fine, fine. But remember who you belong to. That irritated her because she didn't belong to anyone but her husband. Also, get Ricky under control. I don't want him sneaking up on me. I told you, the girl said. He didn't do that. Somehow, Pete struck him fair and square. Andrew laughed. No way could that kitty strike Ricky. He's not a kitty, but if he is, he's my teddy bear. Let me handle him. Andrew laughed. As long as I get to handle you. For now, she wondered what he meant by, for now. The second interesting exchange was after Pete's call from the airport. Joan said, well, he's gone for a week. Andrew's smile was sinister. Great, now we can take a few more days off and screw some more. Joan replied, yes, but not if you keep being so rough. You'll bruise me. How will I explain that to him? Andrew reassured her, you're not supposed to be with him often. How will he see it? He still sees me getting dressed. You said you like it when I tease him, Andrew smiled. Well, if we have lovemaking all week, keep him away for a few days, or he'll feel the difference. A cool bath and 24 hours usually help. Besides, he's not much smaller than you. Andrew didn't like hearing that he took charge. I'll be gentle, like you want, but not at my house or while traveling at your house, he said. I'll screw you my way. You said he wouldn't be back until Friday night. Joan was worried. They had never had lovemaking at her house. 
I'm not sure that's a good idea. If it worries you, we won't sleep there. Just long lunches, Joan hesitated but agreed, planning to call Pete every morning and night to check in. This confirmed she needed to end things with Andrew soon. Andrew smiled, thinking she couldn't get rid of him easily. Pete copied all the videos from the cloud folder. Once they left Andrew's house, he planned to delete the server files, making sure he had the only copies unless Ricky saved them somewhere else. Pete had several calls to make, starting with Brian. Hey, Brian, it's Pete. Got a sec? Sure, buddy. What's up? Remember our conversation when Ricky showed up to apologize? Yes. Ricky was right. Joan's been having an affair for a while. Oh, man. I'm so sorry. This isn't a social call, then. No. I need a good divorce lawyer, quickly. Brian replied, Done. I know just the woman. She can be mean and vicious or just get it over with. Whichever you prefer. I'll give her your info and she'll contact you today. Sounds good. Also, please tell Miriam not to mention this to anyone until I give Joan the papers next week. Sure, Pete. I'm sorry for both of you. We've always liked you and Joan. Thanks, Brian. I'm sorry too. I owe you. No, you don't. We've been friends for a long time and our daughters have been for even longer. This is just me helping a friend. When this is all over, you can buy me a beer. I think I might enjoy that. Brian connected Pete with family lawyer Charlotte Steele, who started preparing divorce papers that evening. Joan's car returned home, and just before Pete went to sleep, Joan called. Hey, Pete, how's Orlando? Hot and humid, typical for late August. How's Memphis? Nashville, actually. I got back this afternoon. It's lonely without you. I wish we could have another Friday night like last week. Yeah, I'd like that too, Pete said longing for the days when he thought his wife was faithful. They talked for a few more minutes, and Joan professed her love. Love you, Pete. Love you too, Joan. After hanging up, Pete felt sad, but got angrier the more he thought about it. The next day, he went back to the airport, rented a car, and found a dojo near the Opry to practice, avoiding his usual spots to keep his presence in town a secret. He spent Saturday and Sunday sparring and working out, feeling good about his abilities, he texted Joan, and she texted back. The camera showed she was alone at home on Saturday, but Eva visited on Sunday, making him sad about the impending loss of their family unit. His sadness turned to determination. Oh well, you have to deal with what life gives you, he thought, ready to face the challenges ahead. On Monday morning, Pete got an unexpected call from Brian. Pete, I needed to call you. Joan contacted Miriam last night. She asked if we could float her resume to our investment advisors because she feels it's time for a change. Miriam said she'd look into it. What do you think? I know this doesn't excuse the affair, but maybe she's trying to get away from that hole. Pete thought about his family and what he planned to do. While Joan would never be his wife again, it would be easier for the kids if she got away from Andrew. Yeah, go ahead. The damage is done, but it might make life easier for everyone, Brian replied. I understand. By Monday afternoon, Charlotte had prepared the divorce papers. Joan called Pete that night, saying she missed and loved him. He tried to return the affection. Donnie also called, and they had a good chat. Pete suspected Eva had an idea of what was happening, but Donnie would be blindsided. Damn you, Joan, Pete thought. He didn't sleep well that night. On Tuesday, Pete worked from his hotel. Around lunchtime, the GPS showed Joan's car leaving her office and heading home. His security cameras alerted him to two cars pulling into the driveway. Pete got ready to drive home, expecting them to be there for several hours. Around 2 p.m., Joan said, We should get back. People will start looking for us, Andrew replied. Don't worry. I own the company. No one will question me. They might wonder about me. I don't want anyone telling my husband. Why? You don't think he'd divorce you, do you? This confirmed Andrew's lack of interest beyond lovemaking. I don't know. He might forgive a one-time mistake, but not this long, Andrew said. You've kept him in the dark for three years. You can manage. Maybe if we only see each other once a month. The last few weeks have been risky. I should get back to the office, and Andrew smiled, thinking about Ricky knowing and maybe participating. Joan was a good employee but replaceable. He felt he had control over her, knowing she wouldn't risk accusations getting back to her husband. Pete parked down the street listening to their activities via the Wi-Fi cameras. Hearing the affair had lasted three years fueled his anger. 
He checked the security system to ensure no alarms or chimes. He snuck in and quietly climbed the stairs, hearing Joan plead, Come on, Andrew, I need to get back to the office. Pete stepped into the bedroom and said, That means get the hell out. Joan, stunned, pulled the sheet to cover herself and exclaimed, Pete, I thought you were in Savannah. This, this isn't what it looks like. Pete replied, Joan, that's the stupidest thing to ever come out of your mouth. Joan's face turned red. Good. At least you have some shame, Pete said. Andrew taunted. Well, the little man decided to see how a real man takes care of his wife. Don't worry, she says she loves you, but we both know she loves having lovemaking with me. Shut up, Andrew. That's not true, Pete said. Joan sobbed. I only love you, Pete. Pete replied, apparently not enough to stay away from him. To Andrew, he said, I remember your baby boy struggling to get up when I punched him. Maybe I should give him another lesson for screwing my wife, or do you want to take your best shot at me? Andrew threatened, I'm going to punch you to pass away in your own house in front of your wife. She wanted a bigger and better man. Yeah, yeah, get dressed and meet me in the backyard. I don't want you unclothed when the ambulance comes, as Andrew retrieved his pants. Pete laughed and pointed at his tool. Joan, you traded me for that baby carrot? You might have wanted a taller man, but you didn't get a bigger one. Actually, Joan said Andrew was a bit bigger, but Pete wanted to make him angry. Pete left the room without waiting. Joan cried harder when she saw Andrew follow her husband. She lunged at Andrew, scratching his shoulders and back, but he backhanded her, knocking her against the headboard and stunning her. Pete, not knowing Joan was hit, quickly went downstairs. He didn't want his home wrecked in the fight, so he put in a mouth guard and ran into the backyard. Andrew followed closely. Andrew taunted, I'm going to enjoy punching you, Pete. Afterward, I'll screw Joan by the pool so you can watch. Pete, speaking around the mouthpiece, replied, I don't care if you screw her. She doesn't matter to me anymore. This is to teach you not to screw married women. Andrew, thinking his superior reach would help, approached Pete in a boxing stance. Pete noticed Andrew's large arms but flabby midsection, suggesting poor cardio. Pete planned to tire him out. For the security cameras, Pete kept his hands up to appear defensive. Andrew rushed, throwing jabs and trying to grab him, but Pete easily dodged. After several failed attempts, Andrew was breathing hard. Finally, Andrew threw a big right-handed haymaker. Pete countered by punching Andrew hard in the right kidney, causing him to bend over in pain. Pete then delivered a vicious elbow to the same spot, bringing Andrew to his knees. Pete waited for Andrew to stand, needing him to look like the aggressor for the recording. Andrew struggled, but eventually got up, trying to box again. Pete, enjoying the sight, returned jabs to Andrew's damaged sides. Each blow caused Andrew visible pain. Realizing he couldn't win, Andrew tried to rush Pete, hoping to grab him. Pete tripped him, then delivered a crushing kick to the groin. When Andrew was on his hands and knees, Andrew cried out and curled into a fetal position, incapacitated. Pity, Pete said. Who's the bear now? You're lucky I don't drown you in the pool. Back inside the house, Joan calmed down, quickly put on a robe, and called emergency services, reporting a fight between her husband and boss. She rushed downstairs with her phone, but stopped when she saw Pete's office. Pete sat about ten feet away on the floor, listening to Andrew whimper in pain. Normally, he would have hated to see anyone hurt so badly, but he felt nothing for Andrew except a sense of justice. He waited for the police or ambulance to arrive, hoping Joan had called them. He wondered where she was. Suddenly, Joan ran out of the house with a rifle, a black eye starting to show. She aimed it at Andrew, yelling, You will not hurt my husband. I'll liquidate you. Pete jumped up to calm her. Not much chance of that happening, he said, hugging her and pointing the weapon down. He gently took the weapon from her and set it aside. When the police arrived, she was still repeating, You will not hurt my husband. The officer removed the shells from the rifle and checked on Andrew. He was coughing up blood, surprising the officer since the visible marks were only red sides and early bruises. Noticing Joan's black eye, he asked, Ma'am, are you okay? She replied, He, then she sobbed and pointed to Andrew. He assaulted me when my husband showed up. Andrew chased him. Pete was bewildered. The officer suggested, Ma'am, you need to go to the hospital so the misuse can be documented. Can my husband take me? Sure, but go as soon as possible, the officer replied. You look unscathed. Are you a black belt or something? Pete shook his head. Or something. 
I know how to protect myself and my family, but I'm much more damaged than you can imagine. Joan wept on Pete's shoulder, knowing she was the one who had hurt him. Pete took her inside to get dressed for the hospital. She asked him to help her change, but he refused, not wanting to see the bedroom where she had been with Andrew. Joan looked like she had aged 10 years as they left. Pete, asked the officer, can we have his car towed? Joan doesn't need to see it. The officer agreed. In the car, they drove in silence until Joan said, Speak to me, Pete. Yell at me, scream at me. Call me a 304 again, but tell me what you were thinking. Pete continued to drive. After a minute, he said, Assault. How are you going for assault? Everyone will know it was consensual. I won't lie for you. Joan's face fell. I want to use this to keep him away. He was too controlling, and I planned to leave him in the firm anyway, she said. So I've heard, Pete replied. She looked surprised. Just because I'm short doesn't mean I'm not smart, Joan said. I know, Pete responded. I would ask why, but I already know. I'm sorry. The sad thing is I would do almost anything for you, but I can't change what you've held against me all these years, Pete said. Please don't say that. I made a horrible mistake, Joan pleaded. We have a great family, house, and jobs. We have a good life, Joan said. Except for your dependence on taller, larger men, Pete remarked. That hit hard. He continued, You should have thought about all those things and decided an affair wasn't worth the risk. I know I was stupid. Can you forgive me? She asked. Pete shook his head. Maybe one day, but not soon, he said. So is there a chance we will stay together? She inquired. No, that isn't going to happen, he replied. But why? Joan asked. Why do you think? Because of the affair. We can go to counseling. We can overcome this, she suggested. Joan, this wasn't just an affair. His son sent me a link to a cloud account with videos of you and Andrew from Thursday and Friday, Pete revealed. She gasped. I don't know if Andrew set it up or Ricky did. Either way, I heard you. You won't have to worry about wearing heels around me anymore. It never bothered me, she said. I wish I knew that. It always bothered you, he replied. You won't have to worry about people thinking your short husband is an easy target. Do you still think Eva made up the story about Paris? Joan asked. Joan's almost imperceptible shake of her head said it all. Oh, and by the way, when Ricky emailed me the link, he mentioned that Andrew had agreed to let him screw you too. No wonder he acted like he owned our backyard. He had no respect for me or our marriage, Pete said. Who disrespected our marriage first? You did, Joan, Pete said. Joan felt devastated when she realized she had disrespected Pete first. She was shocked that Ricky had thought he could have a romantic relationship with her. Now she understood why he had been around so often and couldn't believe how much she had fallen. Pete, I don't know what to say except that I'm sorry, she said. Sorry isn't enough. You lost faith and respect for me, even though I'm a better man than him in every way. That just wasn't enough for you, was it? Joan looked out the window, tears streaming down her face. What now? she asked. I plan to give you divorce papers today. I'll hold off depending on how the next few days go. We're still getting divorced. But giving you the papers on the day you were supposedly assaulted wouldn't look good in court, he asked. So how do you plan to pull off assault? And what was with the rifle? Do you plan to send an innocent man to jail? Pete asked. I wanted to send him to the morgue. But you were just as guilty as he is, Joan said. Get your story straight before you end up in jail. I'm sure your children and family would love to visit you in jail, Pete replied. Joan groaned internally at her predicament. Maybe she should jump from the car after all. As Brian mentioned, they were met in the ER by the hospital administrator and senior legal counsel, both of whom knew Brian personally. The attorney was also distantly related. Their main goal was to ensure Joan and Pete were seen immediately and not questioned until Brian's attorney arrived. Once she did, the attorney quickly understood what Joan was trying to achieve. They documented everything, including the length of the affair, Ricky's involvement, the videos from Andrew's place, and the Clark security system. Joan was humiliated, detailing everything in front of Pete, who was numb with disbelief. The lawyer suggested to Joan that she should try to settle the case outside of court to receive compensation and find a new job at another company. She didn't think the district attorney would pursue charges because the affair had been going on for so long, which could make it seem like a personal grudge. Andrew probably wouldn't want to deal with a civil court case and the negative publicity from the injuries he sustained. Pete asked for a moment alone with Joan. 
I don't care if the settlement is for $10,000 or $10 million. In the divorce, I want the house, a 50 50 split of other assets, excluding my consulting business, and no alimony. You might want to get as much as you can. Wait, you can have the bid after today. That filthy thing is yours. Joan realized she would be alone in this. You would fight me for the house, she said. He replied, after what I've seen and done, you ask what I'm willing to do. Imagine what I could do with those videos. I have the contact info for all your clients and many others. I could send them videos of their advisor breaking vows and showing poor judgment. How many would keep working with you? Go ask your lover how angry I am. If the house is all I take, you got off easy. Every time he said lover, it felt like a red-hot poker. She couldn't deny it. Unwilling to fight Pete over the mess she made, she agreed to get whatever she could from Andrew. After Andrew's surgeries, Joan received a payout from him. It took weeks of negotiation and a few more to get the check, but it was enough to support her for a couple of years if needed. Soon after, she found work with the same investment advisors Brian and Miriam relied on. The salary was lower than her previous job, but it was a position with a large international company that offered future opportunities. She relocated to a three-bedroom condominium close to her new workplace, ensuring there was room for her children to visit. She probably sold off her old bedroom furniture. Despite her efforts to move forward, evenings were difficult, marked by feelings of numbness and despair. She frequently called Pete in tears before ending the conversations abruptly, realizing she might require therapy and support from her children and siblings. Her new job was helped by poaching some of her old clients from Andrew. This was easy, as they liked her and wanted to leave Andrew's firm, especially after a reporter's FOIA request led to a detailed police report. The report described the incident at Pete's house, highlighting the sensational elements which made the news. After his hospital stay, Andrew only said, It's a private matter, no comment. Andrew underwent multiple surgeries to save his kidney, stabilize his ribs, and partially restore a testicle. There was hope he might one day achieve in hardness, but it would likely be painful and might require another surgery. For Pete, it was the longest few weeks of his life. He stayed on the road as much as possible. The following months, including Thanksgiving, were painful. He felt physically ill the day Joan moved out. The breakup of their family was worse than his grandparents passing away. Eva had partially prepared for the situation due to Ricky's comments, which grew into the truth. She hated her mom for hurting her dad and knew it would take time for their relationship to recover. Despite her anger, she decided to support and try to forgive her mom. Eva prepared Donnie so he wouldn't be completely surprised. He was very angry with their mother. In his final semester at Georgia Tech, he stayed out of the drama and ignored her calls. The situation affected both kids' studies. Despite gaining ownership of the house and finalizing the divorce, Pete thought about selling it since the kids were no longer living there. Then his three sisters intervened to try to make him feel better. Second story, I don't know if my girl is loyal or not. My girlfriend and I have been together seriously for a year now. She's in college. A few days ago, she didn't answer my calls at night because she said she was at her niece's birthday party. The next afternoon, she called me from college and said she took the train there. About two weeks later, she accidentally mentioned that she didn't go to the birthday party, but instead went to college with two of her friends, both guys who she admits are interested in her sexually. She said they had some drinks on the way and ended up staying in a motel because it got late. She insists nothing happened that night. I don't know if she's telling the truth or not. If she's not lying, why would she lie to me initially or ignore my calls? I'm not sure what to do.